the mystery of identity is not as complicated as it seems at the point of its inception, at the point of its origin, at the point of its beginning. The mystery of identity is like a clean white slate. Nothing is upon it except the purity of God. The concept has been promulgated before. It goes something like this. Mine eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. And therefore we cannot relate ourselves with iniquity, but only with the purity of God. So our real identity originated in God and is God-like, is qualified with the qualities of God. But along with it, with the precious gift of identity, God gave something else. What was that? It was free will. And so we all share in free will as one of the facets of our identity. And this is what has gotten us into trouble. Not individually alone, but as a whole human race, from time immemorial. Some people think that perhaps God had a bad idea. They say, well, why didn't he just create us perfect? Well, he did. Which brings us to a strange duality. The duality of the level of our God presence and the little manifestation of selfhood that we call ourselves, but which in reality is only our free will motivation. It's sort of a doorway. And it really leads two ways. We can go through the doorway to the left or we can go through the doorway to the right. It's an arch. It can be an arch of triumph or an arch of defeat. And that, of course, is basically our identity. But that is not God's identity, you see. God's identity is the image that he gave to us. It's a part of us, a part of the dual self, half of it. The other half is linked entirely to will and motivation. We do what we want to do, and we create ourselves. A lot of people don't understand that. They always thought that God created them. Well, he did. But what he made was pure and perfect. What they have made is not pure and perfect. So we have two creators, the first creator and the secondary creator. And what we have to do is cause the secondary creator to eventually become one with the first creator, which is God. We have to identify by our will motivation with the wisdom of God and the will of God. Then you see, we become that oneness ourselves. But people don't understand that. They get confused on this whole issue. It's so easy to do it. Because now you see it and now you don't. First you see that all things come from God. You can understand that. There's a source and everything comes out of that sun, out of that source. And then you look at the uh, sort of a chimera of human consciousness, a variegated manifestation. I hope that you understand what I mean because I'm trying to put into finite words man's vision of the infinite. You see, the purpose of this realm is actually an expansion of the spectrum of light. And what has happened here is that the light is shown down in this dimension here. It has expanded its own spectrum. And then we are allowed in this time span to get involved in that. We get involved in all kinds of choices. Because we have a lot of synthetic appetites. I'm sure that God didn't create beef stew. That's what I'm trying to say, you know. So uh, we created it. We created these hungers. We created many of these dishes that we more or less become accustomed to. We identify with these things as though they were actually a part of our life. In reality, they are no part of our life at all when we come to the other side of the road. When we reach the point where we're uh, living in the heaven world, we don't have any need for human meat. You remember about Jesus, how he said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. So we begin to develop then a hunger for the spiritual meat even while we're here involved with many material things. But too many of us get confused and we think that these material things are everything to us. 
and really they are not. They are only a series of appetites that have been handed down from our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers and forefathers. We've inherited it as a race. But it doesn't mean all of that. It doesn't mean anything in reality as far as the immortality of the soul is concerned. I'll show you why. Because first of all, supposing you made your ascension tomorrow, they'd just be excess baggage, wouldn't they? What use would you have for a big house? Well, the whole idea can be illustrated by the analogy of death itself. When a rich man or a poor man, either one dies, what do they leave behind? Naked they came into the world, naked they go out. They can take nothing with them. So the only things that we can take with us are the things that we give away. Isn't that interesting? Had you ever stopped to think about that? One of the masters one time told us that. The master said that I give you my love. He said, all else I have already given away. So I thought that was very beautiful. And it illustrates to us the nature of identity. Identity is ephemeral. Let's go back and take that Mary Magdalene, the prostitute. Let's put her in the position momentarily of being a prostitute. All right. All of her friends knew that, didn't they? They all knew this is what she was. People that knew her intimately, they knew this is what she was. So if someone asked you, what about her? What does she do for a living? Oh, she's a prostitute. You understand? It's a very natural thing. They just talked about it. It's a common occasion. But when she became a Christian, she changed, didn't she? Well, I allow that we have to recognize the potential for human change in all people, not just in ourselves. And we ought not to deny it to ourselves either. We ought to recognize the potential of change. I find one of the greatest of human cruelties in relation to the identity of man is that people like to put you in a hole, a round peg in a round hole. They like stick you right in there and stereotype you. They like to say, this is the identity of so-and-so. This is the kind of person they are. This is what they believe, this is what they think, this is what they do. You understand? Well, that, of course, is, to me, is only the passing stream of identity. It keeps on flowing. Don't people change? I believe they do. I believe they change physically and they change spiritually and they change mentally. We should allow them, people, to have change and to experience it for themselves. Unfortunately, some people have negative change. Many times when they fall low enough, then they know the only way they can go is back toward God. They just simply can't. They can't see it's a dead-end street. They go down, and they're not satisfied. Well, why is this? Because in reality, man is a dual being, as I said before. What do we mean when we say a dual being? When I say a dual being, I mean that he is made up of a divine image and a human image. And the purpose of life is to allow the human image to use its own free will to become godlike. Somehow or other, God doesn't enjoy very much having a group of puppets that he's made surrender to his own will. You can see that, can't you? Isn't that perfectly natural? I don't think even you as an individual would be very happy in making the right choice of living for God and for Christ and for the masters and by the right teachings unless you could make that choice yourself unless you made it of your own free will. Someone else makes it for you, you wouldn't like it. I don't think I would like it either. You might know that you were eating good food. You might know that you were properly housed. You might know that everything was very nice and everything was being done for you, but somehow or other that wouldn't be satisfactory. You'd say to yourself, well, I'm not exactly contented because I didn't elect to come here. I came because God forced me to. He made me do it. And somehow or other, you just don't like that idea. And somehow or other, I don't feel that God would like it either. I have a feeling that God would be very displeased with a bunch of puppets and robots, little puppy dogs that he had fenced into a corral or into a kennel or something and said, now, you stay there, Fido. You do exactly as I tell you to do. And it doesn't go for the making of a God. So why do we have this initiation in duality? Why do we have initiatic experiences? We have initiation given to us because the real purpose of life is to make man into a god. He started out by putting the stamp of the divine image on man. That is his identity. And the master plan for the ages is to create a godlike man, free from all of the dregs. 
In order to give you some idea from a modern text by a man who has some understanding of this, but not complete understanding of man's identity and his real plan, I'm going to read you from the introduction by Georgie e. Kepis this particular bit. Thus, a vision, our creative response to the world is basic, regardless of the area of our involvement with the world. It is central in shaping our physical spatial environment, in grasping the new aspects of nature revealed by modern science, and above all, the experience of artists who heighten our perception of the qualities of life and its joys and sorrows. Vision is a key to man's creative power, even on the most rudimentary level. Our eye receives only the random flow of light stimulation. The light rays that impinge on the retina have no intrinsic order, but our dynamic tendency to create order transforms the basic sense impressions of light signals into meaningful forms. From the welter of sensation bombarding the retinas of our eyes, we articulate structures, images, and from the intermingled, interconnecting, shifting stream of optical images, we separate persistent patterns, things, events. Thus, to perceive an image is to participate in a forming process. It is a creative act in the simplest form of visual orientation and in the most embracing unity of a work of art, there is a significant common basis, the sorting and organization of sensory impressions from the visual field. But vision, though the key orderer, nevertheless receives its scope and scale from what it orders. Our visual experiences are drawn from the features of the visible world around us. The strength, the richness, and the order of the visual forms that we depend to a certain extent upon the nature of our visual surroundings. If in the world man sees around him the rhythm of nature's processes revealed, and if the colors, forms, and movements he sees are expressions of organic events, then his vision is nourished by, quote, the primal sanities of nature, to use Walt Whitman's words. If the primal sanities of nature can be absorbed through his vision. If man is led to see them, he can reproduce them in the world he shapes for himself. Today we have lost the benefit of these natural guides because we are surrounded by the second nature of our man-made environment, an environment that has not grown according to nature but has been shaped by one-sided and short-sighted interests. The appearance of things in our man-made world no longer reveal their character. Images imitate forms. Forms cheat functions. Functions are robbed of their natural sources emanating from human needs. Our cities, our buildings, counterfeit inside and out. Objects for use, the packaging of goods, posters, the advertising in our newspapers, even our clothes, our gestures, our physiognomies are often without visual integrity. The world that modern man has constructed by and large, lacks sincerity and scale. It is twisted in space without light and cowardly in color. It combines mechanically consistent patterns of details within formless holes. It is oppressive in its fake monumentality, degrading in its petty, fawning manner of facelifting. Men living in this environment, injured emotionally and intellectually by the terrific odds of their compassless society, cannot avoid injury to their sensibilities, the basis of their creative faculties. To give direction and order to this formlessness, we have to go back to our roots. We need to regain the health of our creative faculties, especially of our visual sensibilities. There is a reciprocal relationship between our distorted environment and our impoverished ability to see with freshness, clarity, and joy fed on our deformed and dishonest environment, our undernourished visual sensibilities can only lead us to perpetuate the malfunctions of the environment that we create. To counteract 
this spiral of self-destruction, we have to re-educate our vision and reclaim our lost sensibilities. I think this will illustrate perhaps one of the intents of our forthcoming Ascended Master University will be to re-educate the vision of humanity taken in any stage of their evolution and at any age in their chronological development. In other words, a child or a child man or a man or an old man. It makes no difference. We can take people at any age and attempt to re-educate their vision according to the Ascended Master concepts and thus eventually this will permeate the world order and induce the kingdom of heaven as an automatic function of the higher mind in man. Unless we are able to recognize this relationship between our identity and our own creative acts and impulses, we probably are more or less drifting people, drifting in a sea of mind which almost becomes mindless in its manifestation. This is because we become automated creatures of habit. We have an idea in our consciousness that a certain thing is valid. We say, well, I'd like to do that. And we function a great deal on the basis of whimsy and also sentimentality. Sentimentality becomes one of the forces that seems to drive mankind to bargain his life away and impoverish his environment. He wants to do a certain thing because that old tree has always stood there. It's always stood there. He doesn't stop to realize that the overhanging branch makes it difficult for him to get his car in the garage. So he doesn't want to cut it down because grandmother planted it. He leaves it there. And this sentimentality is actually destructive in a way because as soon as his son finds that he has laid to rest his father, he cuts off the branch and maybe the whole tree. So we see that people should be capable of moving with the flow of the universe or the divine Tao, the divine endowment. There is a flow in the universe. Perhaps we may imagine it as coming from the yin and yang of the negative and positive forces of the universe. And this flow cannot and will not be stopped by any of us. We may stop progress in our own time if we want to, by insisting upon the sentimentality of whatever we wish to keep or preserve of our human nature. But if we are determined to actually pursue an avant-garde realization of God, we have to be willing to let go and make progress, keep alive, be eternally young because you can accept the fruits of the spirit of the coming age. The young people here today can little imagine themselves as old men with beards. But I assure you that the time will pass swiftly and they will stand right where the older people now stand. So in view of this tremendous flow and the continuation of the flow, the identity of man which we have termed ephemeral has to be considered because ephemeral means the passing scene. And we have to consider that the scene is passing whether we want to acknowledge it or not. And we are very, very foolish people if we want to let life pass us by as far as opportunity goes. So we've got to look at this identity of ourself and be willing to make changes because we're not only making them for ourselves, but we're making them for our God. This is what St. Paul said. We are changed, he said, from glory unto glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, which denoted to us that there are glories terrestrial and glories celestial. And in and among those glories, both terrestrial and celestial, we find planes of glory, like the steps on a stair or like a ladder. We go up that ladder, the ladder of terrestrial glory. We go through all of the human experiences that we think we find happiness in. Jesus himself said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye find eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He dwelt among mankind, yet said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. I must be about my father's business. He denoted in his consciousness 
that he had a higher walk than the average man and woman. The average man and woman today on the streets of America and the whole world are completely brainwashed, fake as this man said in their monumental stupidity or something of that effect. They themselves are stereotyped images. They wear certain clothes, they wear certain ornamentation, they do certain things. It's the fashion of the times. The current vogue, wherein many of our high school people are wearing long hair, was originally started by, and I'm not speaking to condemn them, I'm simply making a statement of fact, was originally started without their knowledge, of course, they didn't ask the permission of anybody to start it, by certain Marxist communists who were using it to divide and create a generation gap where none existed between the various ages. The reason I have pointed this out to you is because it is a synthetic agency which is intended to create a division among people when there is no division between their hearts if their heart is in the right place. I have been in Haight-Ashbury. I have been all over the country and made personal investigations and motion pictures of many of these functions. And I have found out in my own experiences that many of these young people are highly idealistic and very fine and highly intelligent people capable of absorption into our social order. They, however, are not all completely satisfied with our social order and I think perhaps one constructive change that we have to recognize that will come forth from this because you cannot do anything, whether it's good or bad, without having some fruit from it. And I assume that there are some good fruits that come from bad causes, albeit St. Paul says, let us say to you that they who say, let us do evil that good may come, their damnation is just. So he pointed out that the law of karma is that which functions, and I think a man would be very, very foolish today if he wanted to do evil just so good would come of it. Nevertheless, I think that the fact that innocent evil uh, occurred in the case of many of these people throughout the nation, at the same time some constructive good of change will come from it that will probably bring about a greater introspection on the part of humanity as they begin to examine the phoniness of their ideals. I had a conversation not long ago with one of America's formerly great evangelists. This evangelist told me of a great meeting that they had. And at the close of that meeting, he said they took up bushel baskets of money. And I said, well, that's fine. You really did a good job then. He said, yes, everything was fine. Until, he said, I went out with the minister of the church after the service was over. And I said, well, you describe to me what took place in the church. And he told how the Spirit of God had moved in the people and there was a tremendous uh, outpouring of love and all of that that went on. And I said, well, what happened after the church that disillusioned you after this evangelistic meeting? And he said, well, I got out on the street with the pastor. And he said, he said, come on, let's get in my car. He said, let's go somewhere and pick up a couple of women. And he said to him, well, aren't you married? He said, yes, but what difference does that make? So my friend looked at him and he said, well, it makes a lot of difference to me. He says, I heard you were a square, but I didn't know you were that bad. He said, just get out of the car and I'll go out and find one myself. Bang. And out down the street he drove. And this was down in the southern part of the United States in what's known as the Bible Belt, which was a more shocking manifestation. But I recall the words of Jesus Christ where he said to St. Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Those who would follow the tenets of the brotherhood then should understand that Satan never will bother anybody he's sure of. If he thinks he's got you, he's going to leave you alone. But the closer you get to the light, the more he's going to do to give you some trouble or cause you a fit, as somebody might say. And I think that no greater fit in this world can occur than a man to lower his ideals or engage in the business of hypocrisy. But I must tell you this, because we pull no punches here at the summit. In order to examine the actual nature of evil and good under the microscope and lens of our consciousness, we know that in human conduct, honesty and sincerity ought to go at a premium. 
If we were having an auction, in other words, they ought to bring the top dollar because they're worthy of the recognition of people and I think appreciated by most people. I think the hypocrite is one of the most damaging creatures on the face of this earth today because he doesn't have to be a hypocrite. You know, it's quite popular today for a man to be like Hugh Hefner, the owner and manager of the Playboy magazine. It's quite popular to be that way. And a man wouldn't have to be a preacher if he were not satanically oriented and then turn around and do the nasty and vulgar things that some of these fellows are doing, which are the most antichrist action in this world. And I want to tell you that furthermore, you don't even have to do it yourself in some cases in order to be accused of it. In my own life, I have lived as close as I can to the cross, that is to the way of God. But I once in a while find people who will turn around and try to use their evil tactics to try to defame me. And I am amazed at it, but I can understand it because Jesus himself was accused long ago of being a glutton and a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. Well, I would find myself perhaps justly accused of being a friend of publicans and sinners because I'm willing to associate with all people, just as Jesus did. And I feel this is the role and mark of a spiritual man. You can't be a spiritual man and live always on the mountaintop. You have to be willing to come down to the multitudes and allow the hem of your garment to be touched by the woman. You understand what I mean? I'm not running women down, by the way. But what I'm getting at is you have to make yourself available to people. And if you're living on the mountaintop in what is known as a cloister situation, you may be able to do a great deal of good there for a specific function. But for soul development, I recommend the initiation of the world, and I recommend that if you can preserve yourselves in that hostile environment as an honest man, you will make it not only in this life, but should any lives come after, you will also make it. And ultimately, by pursuing that course, you will have the correct vision of yourself and God, and you're going to turn out to be the kind of a person that's a candidate for the ascension. Believe me. You will never turn out to be a candidate for the ascension by shutting yourself up into a closet somewhere and having nothing to do with people because they're not good enough for you or for God. God himself comes down to this earth through people and he contacts people and that's how he's able to deliver people. A lot of people have told me personally that this work of the Summit Lighthouse has given them tremendous insight and spiritual experiences. They've had wonderful experiences. Why? Because basically it is guided by the masters. But the question has come up, I must admit, where some people have said to me, well, I'm a positive thinker and I don't like to think of anything evil. Why do you sometimes talk about the other side? And I have tried to explain this time and time again, that if we were all saints, and we were talking all to saints, we would be able then to talk only about the spiritual side of life. But when you stop and think that there are negative forces in the world that keep people from attainment, just think of that. Keep people from attainment. You have to talk to them about it sometimes in order to make them to realize the subtlety of it. A lot of times it's very subtle. It rides just underneath the surface of consciousness. And there it will defraud us of our spiritual inheritance if we do not wake up and live. So I felt in the giving of this talk on the identity of man and the real plan of man, we should understand that there also is a fraudulent plan, which probably is a willy-nilly plan, I must admit, that is largely pleasure-based. Where man says, well, I like good food, I like coffee, I like chicken and turkey and steaks, and I like wine, women, and song. Well, they've always had these things on this earth, and that's one of the things that defrauds people of their spiritual inheritance. We don't have to have that kind of a life, but we've got to be prepared to understand those to whom appeals for this kind of life are made. And we should not condemn these people. We should try to help them by the power of our inner nature to find their own reality in contact with God. So let's forget all about that now. We are through with it. We're through with that aspect of vision, but I've touched upon it. Now when we come to deal with the process of involving ourselves in our own identity, we have to first of all possess the quality of enlightened vision. If we do not have enlightened vision, 
we are more or less lost. We're lost in the maze of human conduct and consciousness, our own or someone else's. But if we recognize that our presence can give it to us, we can then understand the mystical significance even of a meditative period. Now what is a meditative period? It's a period when you cut your connections to the world thought and you establish your connections with the divine thought. Well, what are the dangers in meditation? The dangers in meditation are that you will fall asleep and go into the astral realm, that you will become purely psychically oriented. This is one of the dangers you have in meditation. You have to be able to direct the meditation with your conscious mind until such a time as your higher spiritual mind is able to take over, and you will know it. Unless you are able to remain in control of your own environment and yourself, directing yourself as a boatman along the shore so that he doesn't get hooked up or snagged up on something. You have to be able to use that long pole and push yourself off if you see a rock there. And if you're not conscious and you're functioning in a trance state, beware of this state of consciousness because it can often be as dangerous as automatic writing, which is also one of the very great dangers that people encounter in the psychic realm. It has to do with the identity of man, too, because it's one of the dead ends that people sometimes get in. You should all understand, one and all, that the identity of man should be fashioned after the identity of God. Well, you say, how do I know that it's God? And what does God do for me? First of all, he does not have to come forth in human utterances in order to actually do things for you. You have probably noticed in some of the dictations, especially some of you who have actually come here many, many times, that once in a while you have a dictation that is mystical, that is not always clear to the conscious mind as to just what it means. But somehow or other you get a tremendous feeling. And you begin to wonder just why is it that so much is being done for you and you know it's being done, but you can't put your finger on the pulse of it and you don't know what's happening. That is because there is a soundless word. In other words, God's vibrations do not have to extend to the mere utterance of human words and language and speech, which after all is just intelligent sound. What is language and speech? It's intelligent sound. For example, today we say chair. We could say stool. <laughs> and it'd still be a chair, wouldn't it? It wouldn't make any difference what you said. You could say it in some language, you could call it a dodo. <laughs> well, if you called it a dodo, it would still be a chair if it meant that to you. So it's all a matter of image substitution, do you see? It's a matter of image substitution and familiarity. That's why the Tower of Babel functioned the way it did. Tower of Babel. When the angels came down, why all they did is confuse the speech centers in people. And so different words had different meanings, and the ones that believed one thing or heard one thing, they went off with all the rest to talk their language and they parted company with those who didn't. It was quite an experience. Now, however, what we are interested in primarily is man's identity and his real plan. And I've tried to touch on this. Now, man's identity is from the divine source all the way. Remember that. God is the creator of that inner spark in man. But you supposed to function as a God, are the creator of your own darkness. You create hatred. You create feelings of lust and destruction. You create all kinds of ideas. A lot of times it's fanciful. Dream ideas. Ideas that Sigmund Freud would probably have written about if he were alive today. He probably would have defined it a little bit more. Why? because he lived more or less in a sort of a dream world, which is actually fringing on the astral, on the border of the astral world. None of this has anything to do or any relevancy with the true spiritual man. Meditation will give you, for example, often a tremendous feeling in meditation. I can do it right here and now. I mean, by God's grace, I have the power to go into instantaneous meditation. Now, I might do it just for an experiment, just to show you what I'm talking about. And then you can judge for yourself. Now, some of you will pick this up and some won't, but we'll try it and just show you what I mean.
Did you feel that, any of you? Who felt it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, forty, fifteen, sixteen, about sixteen, seventeen people about here felt it. Everyone might not feel it, your senses might not be momentarily opened as quickly. But I went into that state of meditation to show you what I was experiencing, I will tell you what it was, I was experiencing a tremendous trembling of electrical energies, a very high vibratory rate. These energies were basically the universal power of God that crisscrosses across all time and space, the warp and woof of creation. I mean, those energies are vibrating just like electricity all the time through space. They have no time to behold evil. They have no identification with evil whatsoever. They are purely good. But they're not goody-goody-good. See what I mean? They're not the Pollyanna sort of goodness. But it's the goodness that is creative. It's creative energy. And if you lost your body, that would still be there and you'd still be there. But you might not know how to plug into it, how to tune in on it, you see. So you have to realize that this creative energy, this creative feeling, to many people becomes a point where they get enmeshed in that spirituality and they say, well, I've contacted God in meditation. You should feel that power I felt. Oh boy, I really had an experience. But you know something? You can fall in love with that feeling. You can become a person who just wants that feeling like a person wants drugs or sex or whiskey or a cheap movie. You can fall in love with that feeling. And in order to really be spiritual, you have to go beyond that. You have to go beyond that to the nature of God and love him for just being himself. You see, love the power of the creative vision itself. Not for the sake of that power, but because there is an intelligence beyond that power. And here is the strange thing. That's your real identity. It's the ocean of God's spirit. That ocean is everywhere. I can go to India and contact God. I can be here in America and contact God. Wherever I am, I can contact God, and so can you. But why doesn't everybody develop an awareness of that? Now about 17 to 18 people in here could feel that. Why couldn't everyone feel it? Well, some may get it even later today. They have a latent structuring in their glandular system and the opening of their spiritual eye. But the point I'm trying to make is that this can be felt by some. And if it can be felt by some, then it can be felt by everybody. But that in itself is not God, it is the nature of God. There are so many people that get confused by this nature of God that they do not actually come to know him. The real God, then, is the creative essence and the creative plan that is locked as a cosmic engram within your very bones and within the structuring of your whole spirit. You have an inner plan, and that plan is a victorious life plan. That doesn't mean that you have to work as a telegraph operator or a moving picture star or as a Florence Nightingale. It doesn't mean any of these things. You may do any of these things and still be godly. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about developing the creative power of being able to tap the power in the universe and then become the acquaintance of the Godhead as the divine mind rather than the carnal mind functioning as the creative mind in you. The carnal mind in most people becomes the functioning structuring of their being. Do you see what I mean? And everybody finds it very compatible when they're with people of a carnal mind because it doesn't rub them the wrong way. But the moment they come in contact with a Christ or with Jesus or a Buddha or someone that talks about something else, this may bother them. It may bother the carnal mind. So don't be surprised if sometimes people shun you or your vibratory action simply because they are not affinitized with you. Don't think this is unusual. This is natural law. It's natural law always. And you have to understand that law. So when you're dealing with the identity of yourself, realize that identity is a changeable identity. And realize above all that you can develop the creative aspects of your life 
until you can completely identify with God, the God that's behind the manifestation of power, the God that's behind the manifestation of wisdom, the God that's behind the manifestation of love. Many people make the terrible mistake in their whole lifetime of suspecting that the all-important aspect of their life is their twin ray. Well, I think there's no question but what the twin ray has some import to everyone, their own twin ray. But a person can get hung up on that and find that their twin ray has been ascended for 2,000 years. Then they go all around hunting for every gal on the whole planet to find out if she's their twin ray. This is a hang-up, and it's a dangerous one at that. What you really want to do is find the creative aspects that God has put within you, your life plan, and put your energy into that plan and leave it to the Creator to draw you to your twin ray. What can possibly happen if you become a highly developed person is this, that your twin ray will come to you if they're ascended. If they're not, they may be drawn to you on the earth plane of matter, providing you're not already hooked up. But if you're already spoken for and you have a wife or a husband, it's kind of ridiculous to expect that your twin ray is suddenly going to come floating around the corner and say, here I am. <laughs> it's just a bit ridiculous and an awful lot of people sacrifice everything for that. And the love that they have becomes pure sex love instead of God love. You don't want it. You can get this all over the world. It's not what you want. What you really want is divine love. And a lot of people mistake, you see, the human love for the divine love. Now, I didn't say that you should be unkind to one another. I think people can be kind and understanding and loving to one another and courteous, but they don't have to turn around and get involved in all this touchy-touchy business like sensitivity training, where you see some guy feeling a guy's bald head, and then another guy has got his hand on some lady's knee, and all this type of stuff in the name of sensitivity. And as my friend Al Shine out there would say, fiddle-dee-dee. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's a bunch of human foolishness that doesn't take anybody to God. When you try to mix religion with that, then it becomes all the worse. And I think in the state of California, I've found quite a few religions where they are basically oriented that way instead of being oriented the God's way, you see. I will agree there may be some human contentment in it all, but after all, people don't really like to be deceived. I think a very interesting thing has to do with the pigeon drop cases that most of the police departments are familiar with, where someone comes along and they say to some woman on the street, oh, my friend over here just found $10,000 in $100 bills. Maybe you'd like to participate in this. I'll be willing to give you half of it if you'll put up some good faith money. So the woman goes to the bank and draws out $5,000 and she hands it to this guy for safekeeping, and he wraps it in a newspaper, and then he turns around and he pulls a switcheroo on her, sleight of hand, and the little package which he has of her $5,000 becomes another package in which there's worthless newspaper, and he hands that to her for safekeeping, but she doesn't even look at it because she trusts him. Later on, she gets suspicious and looks at it and then calls the police, and you have another victim of the famous pigeon drop scheme. Well, this goes on all the time in the world, you see. Things like this, people become victims of human love and human delusions of grandeur and human ideas of riches and all that. If people put their heart with God and trusted in God, they wouldn't be looking for human schemes all the time to be deceived. But this illustrates that people do not like to be deceived because I want you to know that for every 10 cases that go to the police departments of this nation of pigeon drop, there's probably 90 to 100 cases that never say a word. They just take their licking and the losses and they say, well, I learned a lesson, I was a fool. And they go off and forget about it, too ashamed to tell even the police department that they were so badly duped. You should understand then that in this organization we are going to tell you the truth about these things because it is important to you to learn who you really are. And please understand for all time that the human ego is nothing but the human ego. You just saw Constantine on the screen. Well, Constantine's been dead a long time. And I happen to know a great deal more about him than I'm talking, and he hasn't anybody that's here, so don't get that idea. But the point I want to make is that this changing identity we have is this way. You take one of our ladies here, and uh, you bring her back to her girlhood, like Bridie Murphy, because I don't believe in hypnotism. 
But you go ahead and just do it without hypnotism. You just make her think about when she was a little girl. She starts telling you some anecdotes from her girlhood. Well, over the years, the trauma and pressures of human experience have molded her until she's not the same little girl she was when she was 9 or 10 years old. She's changed. We can always accept the element of change in ourselves as long as it occurs in ourselves because it's so gradual. It's like some man that goes off somewhere to India and he's gone for 5 or 10 years. A lot of changes take place in him and we haven't seen him all these years. And when we see him, all these changes are all at once before us. You see, we can recognize this. But somebody that's with him over in India all that time, they don't even notice his change. It's so gradual. And the gradual changes of life often come to us, although traumatic experiences come too, where terrible things will suddenly turn the hair gray overnight, just like that, boom. Or you might lose your eyesight overnight. I'm talking about the world. I'm not talking about you people. Well, it could happen to you. You're a cross-section of the world. That's not the idea. I just want you to understand that changes come to people. Sometimes the opposite. I met a woman at Mount Shasta one time in spiritual work whose hair had turned completely red, as red as you could ever imagine. And I said to her, I said, well, you're using henna, aren't you? She said, no. I said, what do you mean you're not using henna? She said, I'm not using anything. She said, that's the way the Lord did it for me. So I looked at her hair and it was absolutely a glorious red. And I said, what color was your hair when you were a girl? And she said, red. So you see, it went back to the same stage it was in before by the grace of God. And I thought that was a tremendous thing. Now, when you get back to this identity, you have to understand that you, yourself, one and all, are not going to be any different. And that's one of the problems of humankind. People think, well, I'm going to be different than someone else. I have an ego, and I'm a great artist, I'm a great painter, I'm a great musician. Well, all of the talents in the universe are available to everybody. If you want to put the time into it, go ahead. I can remember very well in one of my past lives where I rode a horse, and I was considered quite a horseman. In fact, uh, rather notorious and uh, quite a swordsman. Well, when I came back into this life, I was in the service in World War II and I came home and I went out in the country to one of my friends that lived there who had a riding horse. And I said, let me ride that horse. And he said, fine, I'll help you mount. I said, okay. So I got up on the horse, you know, and I was very proud. My mother was there. I thought, gee, that's wonderful. I'll be able to ride this horse. But I didn't know anything about re-embodiment at the time. But I got on the horse and down the road I galloped past a graveyard like Ichabod Crane. And as I passed this graveyard, suddenly the horse got frightened by a passing car. He reared up and I slid off and landed into a mud puddle with my army khakis on and I got soaking wet and the horse went on down the road and left me there in this freezing wind and rain. So I had an experience that I could very easily be on horse. So then somebody found out afterward that I was this other character who had ridden a horse. They said to me, well, how could this have happened to you if you yourself were a horseman? And I said, well, I said, you may have been a horseman in one life and not be the next time. <laughs> so you see, in order to really keep a momentum of being a horseman or a swordsman or anything else, you have to actually engage in that business from the time you're a child in any lifetime to pick up the momentum you had where you left off. If you don't do it, you may not even be experienced in it at all, you see. Very natural. So I feel that I have explained to you something about your identity. That your identity is not the passing scene. Your identity is not the circumstances or experience that happen to you. These happen to you so that your real identity can shine forth. And your real identity is your Holy Christ self and your God presence. Individualized. I don't think you'd like to pick up the threads of history, such as you saw today. Supposing you're one of those people that were throwing the people in the lions. My goodness, you wouldn't like that idea now. You wouldn't throw people in the lions now, would you? Well, that's the point. Maybe you were thrown to the lions. You wouldn't like that either, would you? So the whole idea is that a person has to recognize that there's an ongoingness about life. And I want all the people in this activity to try to get as much out of it as they can. You can't possibly get any more out of it than you can actually understand, you see. Although you don't have to actually, I suppose, fully understand it in order to get something out of it. I think, however, you do get more out of it if you understand it. So this is why you should study to show yourself approved unto God. I'm only giving you guidelines. I'm not trying to live your life for you. You have to do that. So I hope that you have gotten something out of this lecture and you understand that your real plan is a plan of the spirit. Now, 
There's one point I might like to end with. Where does the great white brotherhood fit in and how is it that there's a difference in people at the spiritual level of the ascension? Take St. Germain and Jesus, for example, or Lord Buddha. I do not know the actual micrometer measurements of their aura, and neither do you, and I'm not too concerned about it. But it has been said of Lord Buddha that his aura today is bigger than the whole earth. This is possible when you view St. Paul's statement, where he says that the resurrection of the dead is sown in dishonor and is raised in honor, and where he says that one star differs from another star in glory and compares that to the resurrection of the dead, meaning that a person in their spiritual experience can gain through the causal body a bigger and bigger and bigger expanding causal body, you see. Anybody can gain this. It isn't some prerogative that I have, that you don't have. You all have the right to do this. So Gautama Buddha, apparently, through his meditations and through his spirituality in all ways, and through his ability to enter in to the higher communion with the deity, he gradually expanded his causal body until it became bigger than the earth. Then you have other masters where maybe all they can get out is maybe a couple of miles, but they're still ascended masters. Now how in the world is that, you say? That's that one star difference from another star in glory. They're both stars, but one's bigger than the other. And we all have the right, and it equates also with Khalil Gibra's book, The Prophet, where he says, it is a flame spirit gathering more of itself. In other words, you can gather more of God even though you are God. Greater things shall you do because I go to my Father. The individuality of man then, and is his plan individually, is based on free will choice of spiritual experience and spiritual advancement. Nobody on this planet in their right mind is going to push any of you into that spiritual experience. But you may you may push yourself into it. But when you do, let's make it a safe experience, a sane experience, and keep both feet on the ground while your heads are in the cloud. Don't think that God is impractical in these dimensions. He is not. And I equate his mind as functional with the great white brotherhood and the great masters of the great white brotherhood. They function with God. Do you understand me? They function with God to help solve all kinds of human problems. We have known in many cases where the intelligence gathering agency, such as K-17, the great master, has gathered intelligence for the brotherhood. This has been correlated, laid on the council table, and afterward it has been used by the brotherhood to prevent war. Did you know that? They've turned around and used the information to prevent war. Sometimes they do it by leveling karma on individuals. In the cases of Janis Joplin, and a few of those others who were in the rock and roll set that were taking strong drugs, they actually had the karmic hammer lowered on them as an example to some of the young people in America today. The Brotherhood made that request. They said, can we do anything to help the young people to see the dangers? I'm trying to show you that. So the Brotherhood functions very practically and pragmatically in the world. They're not just some kind of a strange mystical organization floating around in some strange body with a little tail of light or something, like a paramecium. <laughs> They're not part of Walt Disney's Fantasia. They're very practical men. And believe me, they can do the miracles they say they can, and so can you. Thank you.